بسم الله الرحمن Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said learning is from the cradle to the grave and that learning process has to continue on through the life of the man or the woman until they die. There is purity in the world. There is purity. There's purity in children and there's purity in adults who have not allowed the world to taint their souls, who've not allowed the world to, to pollute their souls. And if it was polluted, who have worked with diligence at polishing the soul. And this is really what the educational process is. And this is a lifelong journey. Traditionally in the Muslim world, there's an idea of traveling for the, for the sake of God. The pilgrimage to Mecca is like that, but there's also a tradition of, of traveling for knowledge, seeking knowledge. And this comes from a prophetic tradition that's mentioned by uh, Ibn Abd al-Barr, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, seek knowledge even unto China. And the idea is that if there's, if there's knowledge somewhere, that you should go seek it. I grew up in uh, Northern California during the 1960s, and that was a time, obviously, there was a lot of change taking place in the United States. I was actually 17 when I became Muslim, and I just lost interest in school. I was um, starting my first year uh, se semester of college, and I, I lost interest. And that led to a journey, which would be an educational journey. I eventually did come back and went back to the university, and. And, and did a degree in comparative religion. I began to study uh, Arabic and my studies increased and I, I was given an opportunity to go to the United Arab Emirates. During that time I met West Africans from Mauritania and I think what, what really struck me about these West Africans is their presence. They actually walked upright. They were walking with, with dignity, with human dignity. They were proud that they were Muslims. And then I'm finding out these people grew up in tents in the middle of the Saharan desert with goats and sheep and camels and, and, and I'm listening to them talking about fine points of grammar and about the subtleties of the Quran and the subtleties of the prophetic traditions and points of, of jurisprudence in Islam and history. And then one day a man comes from, from Mauritania who's named Sheikh Abdurrahman. And I saw this man and he had something that was different from even what these other people had. And, and looking at this man, for me, was like looking at somebody coming out of the seventh or eighth century. And, and I went, who is this man? And they tell me this is the son of one of the greatest scholars of the Sahara, whose name is Anmur Abu Talhaj. I said, if this is the son, I, I want to meet the father. So my heart suddenly becomes uh, just ignited with this desire to go and see this man. And I set out on that journey. Here's this American kid from Marin County in Northern California in the middle of the Saharan Desert. 
and here's this sheikh. And this is the divested man. This is the man who has, he has, he's given up the world. He is in a state of complete submission. One of the first things that he said to me after I met him, he said, tell me about your dream. And I had had this really extraordinary dream, and the dream was this meeting. The desert people of Mauritania are, they're, they're almost halfway in the unseen world. Their, their dreams are so extraordinary. I mean, we know this about Aboriginal peoples, that they're very connected to the dream world, to the Adam al-Khayal, it's called in Arabic, the imaginal world. And I'm seeing this in these people. You, you think of water and suddenly somebody's handing you a bowl of water. I ended up spending seven years with the Mauritanians and the, the experience of living with these people was, was very, very transformative for me. Seeing them living Islam for me, this was one of the extraordinary things of being out there, is that here's a people that are living Islam. Islam is not an idea in their heads. It's not a political ideology. It's not an agenda. It's not, it's what they're living. It's their eating, their drinking. It's honoring the guest. It's greeting their brother with a smile on their face something that is often rare to find in the Muslim world today. People have forgotten these really basic things which are rooted in the Islamic tradition. And one of the things many Muslims forget is that our own Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was in a sense this bridge between the ancient and the young culture because he was raised amongst the Bedouins and yet he was a city dweller. He was a merchant, and yet his roots were rooted in this ancient culture. And he honored these people in that his religion does not eliminate them. My educational perspective now, it's rooted in my experience both in, in my educational experience in the West as well as my educational experience in the East. I, I was fortunate in, in the secondary level that I went to some of the best high schools in the United States. Um, so at the secondary level, I really did see education at its best in the U.S. When I went to the Muslim world, uh, the school that I went to in the Emirates, which was actually uh, considered a, a reasonably good school, uh, I think the, the experience was so shattering for me to see how poor and, and what a pale imitation the educational model that the Arabs have now is basically a pale imitation of the West. And what struck me about the Mauritanians is that they have maintained traditional educational structures. And so studying with them, seeing the texts that they studied, the ways that they studied, and actually studying it myself and doing this, what really struck me was the need to preserve this tradition. The education of the Muslim is the education of the heart. It's purifying the heart. And so education becomes a vehicle or a means. The word in Arabic, darasa, means to study. It also means to become effaced. It means to lose all traces, and, and obviously one of the means of traces of ignorance, but also just losing this personality, this ego, this desire for me, that the world is for me. And we've got a planet filled with people that are saying, me, me, me. me, 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 me. And the world is not me, the world is us. This is the world. 
And this is really what Islam is teaching us, is that, that, that we have greater concerns, that our concerns should not be selfish concerns. And the reason for that is because this is not the ultimate place. There is so much confusion in the Muslim world about education and about what we're supposed to be learning and also some really basic things. There's a lot of confusion amongst the Muslims about what Islam is. There are many Muslims that have really taken Islam as a political ideology and while Islam doesn't exclude politics, it is certainly and never has been at rooted in its center a political agenda. People clamor now for an Islamic state, and yet an Islamic state of being and state of mind has to precede the idea of a, a, a political state, and you don't find people in an Islamic state of mind. The great questions of the Quran are spiritual questions. And the verses out of the over 6,000 verses in the Quran, those that relate to political uh, and juridical legislation are about 500. The vast majority of the Quran is, is relating to the spiritual concerns of man. And this is not to the exclusion of the world. We, we, the Muslims are not, we don't separate our spirituality from the world. The, but our spirituality is our politics. And that, that is how politics is transformed, when politicians become spiritual beings that are concerned not simply with their own agendas, but with the, the betterment of their societies and with a sense of service. The Islamic education is to teach these tools to people so that they can move into the world with trained minds. And, and connecting their minds though with that heart, never losing the connection. And so the spiritual rooted in this training is not simply the abstraction. It's not simply learning these sciences, but it's sitting with people who are not only transmitters of this knowledge, but also spiritually transformed individuals, people that have gone into the depths of their souls and have moved internally, have, have trained their souls at the hands of those who trained their souls back to the Messenger of God. And these people that have unfortunately become anomalies now in the Muslim world, but still exists, men like Murab al Hajj. And going and sitting with these people and learning this knowledge from them, another knowledge is being transmitted, the knowledge of humility, the knowledge of purity, of not having ulterior motives. And this is hard for people to understand who have spent their entire lives in the world of ulterior motives. It's hard to imagine that there's actually people that might not have an ulterior motive in wanting to be good to you, in wanting to help you. It's really the purification of the self from cynicism, right? I mean, and it's, it's something that's deeply rooted in our, in our worldview, cynicism, a peculiar Anglo-Saxon characteristic, right? One of the great paradoxes of the liberal democratic culture is that once we make this assumption that the individual and everybody is entitled to their opinion, we have a world filled now with uh, people that really are entrenched uh, in opinions that they think, in fact, are their own, and they're really not. When people say to me uh, things like, oh, well, that's, that's your reality, but that's not my reality. This is a stand. It's a philosophical position. It wasn't arrived at 
uh, through your thought, you are an inheritor of a philosophical position, which is that there's nothing of value in the world. And if there is, it's relative. There is no truth with a capital T. There's small case truths. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. And this is not the language of the ancients. It's the language of the moderns and the postmoderns, and this is what's destroyed us. And then how do we, how can we condemn what's wrong? Once you reduce the world to this leveled effect of everything being equal in its importance, then where is there room for real truth? This is why we, we talk about values now. We don't talk about virtues. Values, because values are relative. What's expensive in one place is cheap in another place, right? Whereas virtue, when we talk about virtue, which comes from a Latin root, which, which means true. And this is what religious traditions have taught. They've taught virtue. And this is what's been removed from the modern society. And virtue is truth. And people say, well, different cultures have different virtues. No. Honesty is a virtue in every culture on this planet. Courage is a virtue in every culture on this planet. Generosity is a virtue in every culture. And wisdom, understanding, the intellectual virtues. You have the moral virtues, the intellectual virtues. They have to be tempered by the religious virtues of faith, of hope, of charity. This is how the ancients understood the world. The things of the world have always been here and they will be here as long as the world's here. But each one of us is going to go through the world and, and, and really spend a short time in this world in relation to human history. So we are confronted with questions of ultimate concern. Where am I going? This is one of the great Quranic questions, فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Where then are you going? And, and confronting each one of us, being confronted with that question, is something that the Muslims have always been concerned with. And that question is not a political question. That question is a spiritual question.